<laughs> Jim Quick. It's on. Aaron Alexander, let's do this. Official slap. All right, I'm going to uh, represent. Sit, What's yeah. this shirt all about? Follow your heart. Follow your heart, but bring your brain. What's this heart-brain connection in your experience of life? I think that there's a – it's been my experience that there's this resonance uh, between the heart and the brain. I do this exercise where if I feel stressed or I feel like I'm out of sync, I'll just do – you can actually do this too. Just take my hand. This is very simple. I take my palm and just put it on my head, put another my other palm on my heart, and I just breathe like – into that space. And if you're just listening to this, you probably could do this also as well. And, and there's a video. There is a video. Hand on the head, hand on the heart. And what you'll find is, um, so you just have shown where you'll have it like an EEG and an EKG and they'll actually harmonize after a few minutes of doing that mm. and that's where you're going to just make better decisions you know when you're in your head and in your heart so you we got do that we're harmonizing and attuning with each other's hearts just by being together as well from mm -hmm. my understanding you heard this? I have heard that. Yeah, that's uh, Joe Dispenza gets into all that. Is, mm -hmm. is where I got. It. I mean, other people get into it, but unless he he speaks on that. Yeah, actually, at this uh, event that we're at right now, uh, Joe attended one of my uh, one of my one of my brain trainings here. He's he's remarkable. Yeah. So ama amazing work, and that's why it's another yet another reason why you want to you know be conscious of the people you're spending time with. Yeah. So you're, you're constantly. You're somewhat of like a mega empath, I think. Is that you're like very sensitive to people's energies and such and like rooms and the way people feel and is that right? Do you feel that? What's it, your sense of being in a room? I think it came from um I am super sensitive, um borderline hypersensitive. Hmm. It's um many people know, I know we've we've you and you've been on my show and we've had conversations on your show before talking about uh, my brain injury. When I um when I had this accident when I was five, this traumatic brain injury, I became very self-conscious. Like my personality changed uh, because of the the, tra the trauma, but also socially I became, I mean, we were very, in my family, you know, my family immigrated here from Asia. They, they were very, very introverted as, as it was, but after my injury, I became shy, which was more of a self-esteem thing than in than it is when you're introverted. So I became, I would just watch people because, w y you know, I'm really into superheroes and I talk about superpowers. My superpower growing up as a kid was being invisible. <laughs> I didn't want the spotlight. I didn't want to be called on in class. I would constantly, and you're my movement coach, my kinesthetic coach, you know, my, my posture even now it has still has memory of just shrinking down because I was always shrinking down because I wanted to be small so people wouldn't pay attention to me because I was, you know, I was labeled in when I was nine, the boy with the broken brain by a teacher who was just frustrated of explaining things over and over again to me. You know, she, she, you know, she did the best to her ability maybe, but she called me that label in front of the whole class. And so I was always shrinking because I didn't want to be called on. I didn't want, I would do a book report, but um, if the teacher asked me to present it, I would lie. And all those weeks of effort would go into the trash and I would throw it out yeah. because I didn't, um, I was very, it's weird, right? Like my two biggest challenges were public speaking and learning. And the universe has a sense of humor because that's all I do. I public speak on this thing called learning. So why was the transition to, with that? So it's to your, but to answer your question, the reason why I feel like I, built these empathetic superpowers is because I would just watch people all the time. Yeah. And because I was suffering and struggling, I would feel suffering and struggling in other people because I would just observe and get curious, be like a little, like a wallflower and, um, and it'd be super sensitive. And because I knew what it felt like to not be enough, I was always, and that's why even when I'm teaching, I go through these, uh, I'm constantly putting myself in situations where I feel uncomfortable um, you know, I, I just started retaking uh, flying lessons. <laughs> I, I did this like, you know, 10, uh, t 15 years ago. I started to take, because I want to do things. I want to remember what it feels like to not be able to do something. So, um, so I could be a better teacher. And I, because you don't want me to, I don't want to take for granted that everyone should be a speed reader or have an incredible memory. 
and I remember what it's like to take on something new and the insecurity and fear of making mistakes and not being good at it. I want to always be sensitized to, to that feeling. I think it makes us better coaches. Yeah, so that's that's most people's number one fear, they say. I don't really know what people's number one fear is, but nonetheless, to say that public speaking is like a number one fear for a lot of people, like being seen, potentially being vulnerable, being mm. judged, critiqued. Um, so you go from the absolute extreme end of, of experiencing that to all of a sudden, for a living, being a professional public yeah. speaker. So how do you... How do you align yourself before speaking that you're not just shitting your pants? <laughs> um, so the past 10 days, I've been on three continents, and I've addressed um, over 15,000 people live. It's um, it's still not my, my go-to because I still am an introvert. So it's still um, an introvert is I feel my friend Simon Sinek has told me years ago that his functional definition of an introvert is somebody who wakes up with five gold coins. Imagine that. And um, just a shout out to all our introvert friends out there. Um, one of my favorite books is called Quiet. You should read it by, by Susan Cain, which um, really is a permission book for introverts saying there's nothing wrong with you mm -hmm. um, and the power that comes from, from being an introvert. But um, Simon says you wake up with five gold coins and every time you interact with somebody, they take one of your coins until you're eventually depleted and you got to recharge. And an extrovert is somebody who wakes up with no coins and they go around connecting with people and they get coins and they get energized and energized. Cool. Um, so for me to do what I do, it's still not natural. Um, you know, I know all the EFT and self-hypnosis too, but it's not my nature because I'd rather, I, I recharge and I replenish, but I do it because I feel like, you know, shame on me if somebody is uh, suffering and struggling the way I did and I don't help them. And so that's why I did my podcast, and that's why I travel doing this. Um, now, how do I align before I get on stage? I um, My rituals have pretty much been consistent. I've been doing this now for 28 years. Um, I I focus, what gets me out of my nervousness is focusing on the, the people. Mm -hmm. I will, if I can, go into the audience before, um, just like I did today at this event, before the people sit down and I'll like sit in their seats wow. and I'll kind of feel the room and I'll imagine looking at me on the stage doing my um, my teaching but from their point of view and it you know I sit in their seats and I sit in three different places around um, and that's kind of something I always do um, how I get my body primed um, I mean you you've been working on on my body uh, for for a number of years now um, you know, I, because I travel, my body is, holds a good amount of tension. Yeah. So I try to, um, I try to do some stretching. I, I recently started to do a little animal flow, um, so we could we could talk about you know That's like we, we could do that like afterwards. But I, I like to move because as your body moves, your brain grooves, and you know we hear sitting is the new smoking and all you know all these things. But we I've learned a lot from you. You know, you've spoken at our events, and I try to incorporate movement all the time so right before i go on i'll just um just loosen my body up um do some uh, deep breathing and and i'm really i'm ready to go because i i believe that the life you live or the lessons you teach i just teach the things on stage i don't do any mental prep i i trust that it's going to flow through me hmm. um that's How why you get out of the way of yourself just preparation just so much preparation that it's just it is you yeah, and my preparation comes from living. So I would say that I do the things that I teach. Um, so I think that's the most important thing. I, I have some, I'm, I years ago I got a little bit jaded in the personal development wellness industry because I um sharing stages with some of these people that I grew up listening to or reading. I felt like I knew them, especially the way I read a book or listen to their audio books um but then when i met them a couple of them like really were not anything in and in not in, in, a, in a negative way like not empowering way of who they i thought they represented and that was a little bit shocking in terms of their habits and their how they treated people or whatever and, you know not congruent with with their message yeah. or even what they ate or what they did you know i was just really surprised that's all and uh, nobody's perfect and i'm not even suggesting that it's just um i 
just document on social media what I'm doing, much like yourself. Like who you are on your show is just who you are when we're hanging out. And I just think that's – and you think that would be kind of obvious, but it's it's refreshing. Yeah. Sometimes. What do you think that is, the duality of people that put on like a, a, sh- a show or a presentation, uh, uh, you know, a performance of their thing, and then they have their life? Like I mm-hmm. – I think that sounds quite fine. It just sounds so tiring. Like I just don't have the energy and to be able to to do that. Is the reason why? And that's the the big, you know, when we hear words that are overused, transparency or authenticity, I feel like for me it it really is about energy. And I'm, I mean, I'm on stage different than I am, you know, when I'm with with friends and and out socially. On stage, I have to be a, more dynamic and engaging <laughs> than maybe is my set point. Yeah. But I do it because I teach accelerated learning, and I know that learning is state dependent, and I need to engage people with a certain level of um, of uh, of activity, and and uh, yeah, and so um, but that 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 is a different side of me, but it's still me. Um, I feel like that our we put energy a lot of people, you know, and all of us to some extent, the three different areas. So we put energy into this image of what we want the world to see us as and then we also put energy towards an image that we fear people um we are hmm. you know what i mean so energy is going into this fear place of where we think we are yeah. and uh, you know where where we have you know where we have we feel like we're not enough and it has all you know the that helplessness it's like a black hole yeah and then the, the energy of putting to you know to our true nature but you're right. I, if people feel fatigued and they feel tired and they feel burnt out, maybe it's because they're putting this energy into three different places yeah. as opposed to to one, you know, integrated place. Yeah. Yeah. Incongruence. That's a mofo. It it, it it's it's <laughs> and then the person we're hurting is is is, is ourself, and it's always easier. And everybody, because we're tricking it's people. It's so it's so interesting. Like leading people. Yeah, and. And so it, I got this message the other day on social media. They were like, Jim, how do I remember, you know, memory techniques, right? They, I get them all the time. How do you remember names? How do you remember my, my you know, the, the taking the bar exam or, you know, this, this anatomy thing or whatever, or languages. The other day I, I got a message from this person. It's like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm dating all these women, you know, and I'm trying to keep up with all the things I'm telling them. You know, these like these, you know, these lies. Right. And I'm just like, dude, how much energy are you putting in? Like he wants me to tell him about how to use the memory palace to be able to, you know, keep right. ideas about, um, you know, like one line about this and this and who the he is in this context of this. And I was just like, dude, it's just just be true. Like you don't need a great memory if you're just going to be honest. Yeah. So how do you speaking of that, how do you prime yourself to be in a ready state to receive and process information? Yeah. How do you do that? So I feel like, um, so I always talk about, in, in the last episode, I, I really think people should listen to the, the, the episode that you and I did together. Um, but the foundation is, I, I talk about head, heart, hands. That you could visualize something in your head or have a goal in your mind, uh, KPI, and have some kind of outcome. But if you're not acting with your hands, then you know engaging that second H, which is your heart, if you're procrastinating or putting things off, you know, tap into your, your purpose. I think motivation is a little bit of a, of a myth when it comes, because I think motivation is important to prime yourself to learn something, but it's not sustainable. You have to kind of pump yourself up a little bit. Um, in the personal development space, they talk about how, you know, motivation is like a warm bath. You know, it just wears off a little bit. And, but I think for me, I break it down into just three parts motivation because I want it not a surge of motivation as much as I want sustainable motive for action and so part of it is tapping into my purpose like um, a lot of people didn't learn things back in school really well because they they didn't have they didn't see the relevancy like if you think about the Pythagorean theorem and the chemical you know elements of the periodic table sine cosine tangent x like people didn't see the reason so they they, they didn't get the result yeah. You know, that information didn't stick because they didn't right. see how it was practical. <laughs> um, so I think the reason and the purpose is very important to be cl- the clarity around um, around why. You know, Simon Sinek wrote that, you know, landmark book called Start With Why. I think people need to tap into that, that why. I think also to have, um, to prime myself, part of it is also habits. And when I'm looking at habits, what I'm really looking into is small chunks. 
I noticed with behavioral change, and we've done six episodes on how to create habits and, and break old bad habits, you know, the, the through line behind a lot of the work is creating micro commitments where we know, for example, flossing your teeth is good for your health. We yeah. know people who floss their teeth, good oral hygiene is going to help them to live longer. But a lot of people surprisingly don't floss their teeth. And so if you want this morning, because I gave a shit about the day. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Yeah, I was like, today is a, I got to prime myself. I'm yeah. Flossing. And we did, um, and, and we also <laughs> did, um, I, we both had uh, a James, James Clear yeah. on, on our, you know, on our show, talk about atomic habits. And it's, it's like, you know, you don't have to floss all your teeth because maybe that's too overwhelming because some people, they put things off just because in their mind it's bigger than it really is. Then you just ask them to floss one tooth or get in the habit. Just of, the tip game. Yeah. Ex exactly. And so if I wanted somebody, I think it's important for people to, uh, to read <laughs> every, um, every single day. I think reading is to your mind what exercise is to your, uh, to your body. Um, but, and we did an episode on how to read a book a week. It actually equates to, this is interesting because you're, you, you know, you just submitted your book. I'm about to submit my book to my publisher and you're I'm doing the word count. The average book, you know how many words are in, in your book? Yeah, you uh, it's like 78,000. Yeah, so the average, it's more than average. The average has about 64,000. Um, so it, that sounds like a lot of words. And I think, you know, a lot of people would like to read more and read a book, you know, 50 books a year. That's amazing, one book a week. Um, if the average person reads about 200 words per minute, that's 320 minutes to get through one book. When you divide it by seven, it comes out to about 45 minutes a day. So it gets more manageable. Yeah. Exactly. 45 minutes a day, you could read a book a week. Um, but some people, 45 minutes is way too long. You know, we're talking about priming yourself to, to read. And once I tap into motivation, what I'm going to get out of this book, you know, because reasons reap rewards, then I'm going to think about, well, how do I break it down into like, maybe I don't read for 45 minutes. Maybe I read one sentence. You know what I mean? Because I doubt I'm going to stop at one sentence. Or if you want to be able to work out, it's just getting your getting your shoes on or taking them off maybe, you know, yep. um, or just getting to the gym if, or the Pilates studio. I mean, once you're there, you're going to do it. So the first part is finding your purpose, asking yourself why, and really tapping into the results that will come from it. Number two, I'm thinking about chunking it down to such a small part you cannot fail. And, right. you know, what's the smallest chunk to be able to move you towards it? Um, there's something called the Zygarnik effect. It's um, a psychologist, Dr. Zygarnik. She was in Europe and she was in a cafe and she noticed that the wait staff would retain all of the orders that the customers um, had placed until the orders were delivered. And once the orders were delivered, they would have amnesia. But she called it the Zygarnik effect, basically saying that the mind doesn't like open loops, that if you start something, you're more compelled to f close it and finish it out yep. it's you know why we watch binge watch netflix because at the end of an episode it gives a big cliffhanger and you have to close that loop by watching the next one and the next That's one, how the next we're, one. we're preyed on by social media exactly very much so so utilizing these things towards your own benefit and your own wellness i feel like um get the purpose micro commitments and then the third thing is you need energy we don't think about it very often but a lot of people are not motivated are passionate because they just lack the vitality. They suffer from brain fog, mental fatigue, and it's hard to, you know, like if you don't have the neurological, biological energy and the nervous, the nerve energy, it's hard to be able to complete those things. So, you know, we talked about in the last episode I did with you, like, you know, 10 of the things I believe really enhance cognitive energy. Things like a good brain diet, things like sleep, things like movement and yeah. uh, stress management and so on. So how I get prime myself really is to tap into those three forces. I think about what am I going to learn from this and really feel emotionally the benefit. Then I think about what's the smallest chunk, and I'm always looking to optimize my uh, my cognitive load, if you will. I heard recently a statistic. You, you're probably familiar with this one. It's the specifics. I don't remember exactly. I need your help. Um, that 87% of people, part of the statistic, essentially don't like their work. So there's like, it was something They're like, disengaged. yeah, like 50 some percent of those people, they call them like, I think sleepwalking. 
mm-hmm. where they show up. You know, they pour the coffee, they do their, they're just they're just checked out, and their body's just this machine that does the thing. Yeah. And then a smaller percentage, twenty or something like that, hate their work. They despise it. And then there's this thirteen percent. They're like, man, this is good stuff. Like I can't wait. Yeah. You know, and it, I think it's really interesting. We're doing all these tactics to fight brain fog and all this stuff. And it's like, well, if 87% of you don't actually want to be here, mm-hmm. it's like maybe brain fog is like a good indication that you that it's time for an adjustment. And I think it's everything, these emotional things that we feel aren't necessarily bad. They could serve us because they're these signals for action. Like I, I want to feel fear or discontent or maybe when i feel nervous before a talk maybe that's great because that's energizing me and it's sending me a signal that i need to prepare or i need to be present or i need to be able to show up so i feel like if people are dissatisfied and not engaged in their work or they feel like they're checked out i think um, check your environment because the environment you know really affects your internal environment and i feel like also a lot of people who complain about being burnt out it's not because they're tired like this, this fatigue all the time, it's not necessarily because they're doing too much. Maybe they're doing too little of the things that really make them feel alive. Yeah. It's like and, crooning, uh, taking daily, auditing yourself. You know, what, what, what my, my life really serves me and stokes my fire. And what am I just, do I just feel obligated to keep on going through these medial tasks? What do you prune out of your life in, in, your, yeah. in your go? Uh, uh, on, on that, I would, I would say that because we, we both, um, I'm sure, get this question a lot about passions and purpose. Yep. Like, you know, my, my job doesn't feel like it's my passion nor is it my purpose. For for me, I really think that a lot of people need more novelty. They need to actually give themselves more stimulus sometimes, just like you would a child if you're a parent and give them enough stimulus and novelty to see what they gravitate towards. Um, and I always tell people to try things at least three times, like try it once to experience it, try it again to get decently good at it and maybe try it again to see if you like it and you enjoy it or not. Um, and then also a lot of people are always shrinking because they don't want to try new things because they don't want to look bad to other people, which is, uh, which is a different sort of problem. When I, um, I do a lot in Hollywood, helping them to, um, to read their scripts or to memorize lines faster or to be focused on set. And I was doing a training for Jim Carrey, and I spent the day with him at his home, and we were making some brain food uh, during a break. And uh, I asked him, why, why do you do what you do? And he was like, Jim, I act like a complete fool on camera, so extreme, because I want to give people, it's on purpose, I want to give people who are watching at home permission yep. to be themselves. You know, if I could act that extreme and that silly, then, then, uh, then people are like, oh, you know, this is, in, by comparison, this isn't so bad. And, um, and I feel like I, I spent a lot of time, I get a little bit choked up when I think about it. I, um, I spent a lot of time in, um, nursing homes in, um, in senior centers. And while I train at the Cleveland clinic, the center for brain health, their doctors, their caregivers, some, their, you know, their patients, um, cause I'm very, you know, I'm really an advocate for brain health and brain fitness. Um, I do it because I, um, I, first of all, growing up, you know, we were really taught that there's a lot of wisdom and, you know, to respect our elders because of that life experience. I love learning because I feel like I can learn from anybody, especially people who have been on the planet for a lot longer than, than I have. Um, and on the other side, I think I can learn from a child who's, you know, also as well. But the other part about it is, um, I lost my grandmother when my, when my parents came here, um, they, uh, you know, we, we, it was, didn't speak the language, you know, that story didn't have, had zero money. We lived in the back of a laundry, in the laundromat that my mother worked at. Um, but so my parents had multiple jobs. Um, so my dad left um, where he where he lived in Asia because his, both his parents had passed and they couldn't afford to, you know, feed him. So he lived with an aunt in the United States. And um, and so his aunt raised me as, you know, that was my grandmother. Uh, but she um when i was going through my brain injury when i was about you know five six seven years old and that challenge my she uh she was losing her mind and uh to uh, dementia to alzheimer's and it's really hard as a child that the impression just to just to talk to her and you know she would call me by a different name or she would repeat something she just said 30 seconds ago you know when people lose their memory and then on their mind they lose you know part of who they they are right like because who are we other than you know, like the story that we remember. 
Yeah, very much so. <laughs> and um, so I spent a lot of time with 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 um, with seniors, and but the but the common besides polishing off their memories and and helping learning, I also hear regret. You know, when you when you're at those final stage of your life, and you're vulnerable, you share the things that you know you feel like you could have done differently. And the common regret I hear continuously for for two decades is um, somehow some people people live their life differently and they would do it differently but they somehow limited themselves because of they chose a career because their parents it was expected by their parents or by by friends or the keeping up with the joneses or they didn't date this person they were really connected to because of what other people would think and um you know i always tell people like when we're taking our final breaths none of other people's opinions or our fears their expectations none of it's going to matter what's going to matter is how we lived how we loved how we laughed how we learned you know those things so come from that place and uh, that's what i feel like those are essential for us to feel fulfilled and and joy and happiness when we're growing and we're giving and i feel like we get one life um you know why aren't we running like we're on fire towards our wildest dreams and some of it, I think, is we know our passions and purpose, but they're buried under other people's opinions and expectations. And this is very real and raw for me because I lost uh, a good friend uh, recently, a couple weeks ago. You, you, you might know him, or I know a lot of people listening probably know his work, Sean Stevenson. Uh, Sean Stevenson, um, <clears throat> you know, we've been friends for over a decade. They call him the three foot giant. Yeah. And, um, you know, he has, uh, a, a, he, he was born with a. Uh, a bone uh, disease where he even went through the process of being birthed he, he had broke bones he broke over 200 bones before why as a before he was an adult and he was you know he was confined to a wheelchair and he recently passed but his message and you know he helped me so much through some of my um, my growth and transformation and trauma um, and he spoke at all our, you know our events and but his mission was to rid the world of insecurity you know, here's this guy who worked at the White House. He was like, he was blessed by the t by the Dalai Lama. He worked with Tony Robbins. You know, he had a really full life. He he. I was at his wedding. He had the most beauty, you know, beautiful family, and everything. And it's it's um, you know, and he he passed at the age of forty unexpectedly. And now I've been watching his videos every single day since then, because I could still feel like he he lived more in his life than most people will in in three or four or five lifetimes. And, you know, it's a I watch him to celebrate it, but there's so much wisdom there because he may t he really took all, all the excuses away from people. We live in a world sometimes where people, you know, more than people would like probably feel entitled. You know what I mean? They, 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 and here's the thing, like excuses are really are useless. You, you can't be upset by the results you're not getting from the work you didn't do. I, I'm, I'm totally surprised when people message me about something or they, they didn't, you know, they didn't apply anything like they, they'll buy a program or something or a list of it, but they didn't do it. And then they're, you know, they're expecting to get results without putting forth effort. I don't know. Yeah. What, are, what are your thoughts on? I think we got to wrap this thing up. I was like, <laughs> I was, I, I want as many humans as possible to hear that last 10 minute rift that's all i was just i was yeah. just i was just like back i have nothing to say no I was <laughs> <laughs> we, gotta, we gotta flip over to the other to the other side how do people thank you so much man dude i i, I really always i i appreciate you i want to thank you for your your friendship and also your support and mentorship you know these years because you know traveling as, as i i've been and just you know being on this mission it's um you know it really it really it mean it means everything and you know I, I believe really do believe a big part of it is spending time with people that you admire and yep. i'm saying the people who are listening that you know everybody needs somebody who encourages them yeah who supports them or cheerleads or challenges them and if you haven't found that person yet be that person for somebody else and most importantly be that person for you because if you're struggling with burnout or you feel like you know your energy is being dissipated part of self-love and self-care you know, well, for part of it is falling in love with that person in the mirror who, who's, who's been through so much, but is still standing, right? Yeah. And nobody's, nothing's going to fill your cup and your soul, what you could give you, nobody on the outside. But I would also say part of self-love is 
making sure that every time we say yes to somebody or something that we're not saying no to ourselves. And I would remind everybody who's listening and you might be applying this even better than I am, but just a reminder for the times we're not is to as part of self care is setting boundaries on, um, on our time, on our, on our, on our emotions, on our heart sometimes. Um, because you can't, you can't give what, what you don't have. But, um, but I want to appreciate that you always fill my cup. So I, I appreciate it. Thank you for the great work that you do. And so to man. say that I really publicly and thank you're you, awesome. brother. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, people, um, podcast, I, w- I would love it if people, you know, we have a 10, 15 minute podcast. You've been on it. Um, I'll co-release this as well. So if people yeah. enjoyed this and they're still with us in the ride, then, uh, so we're, we're going to do yours right now. That's perfect. Yeah. And then, um, I would challenge everybody to do this cause I, I always think everything has to come to some kind of action is uh, I would challenge everyone. If you got some value out of this, take a screenshot of this episode, tag Aaron, tag myself in it, post it and share your big aha, or maybe one new thing you're going to do because of it. It could be that really small little thing. Um, because I feel like you can learn it better if you teach it and you share it. It becomes more of who you are. So it's not something you heard on a podcast. It's like integrated into your identity. And um, when we teach something, we get to learn it twice. So take a screenshot, tag us both in it so we can see it. Share your big aha. And um, as always, I'll, I'll reshare and repost some some of my favorites. I can't wait to read it. Oh, me yeah. too. Thank you so much. Dude. Thank you, brother. Um, thanks for listening human beings out there uh we're gonna jump over to what is your podcast called quick brain quick brain jumping over to quick brain quick brain over now thank you